All right, all right. Sunday, 1.30 p.m. Uh, heck of a week last week. I'm here with uh, Fassel, our equities analyst, and today's discussion is about, obviously, the uh, coronavirus, how the stock market's been doing the last week, what we can expect for the upcoming week, and many more things. Welcome, Fassel. What up? It's great to be here after such a crazy week last week. Oh my God, I know, right? And before this call, we were just discussing this, this sea of green. You know, I feel like this is such a deceiving picture, isn't it? Well, in hindsight, I think so. But if you're just talking about what, what happened Friday, I think it's a perfect representation of what happened for sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, I feel like in the larger picture, you know, more often than not, people have a tendency to try to call the bottom, you know, preemptively. Uh, and, and basically, you know, when they see a sea of green like this, this is, in my opinion, the, the perfect way to sort of, sort of lure in amateur investors, you know? I totally agree. And it's a great way to lure in big institutions, too, who have been dying to get back into the market. They're seeing their favorite stocks like Microsoft, Facebook, Apple at at relatively low prices compared to where they were, you know, a year ago, two years ago. And if you're someone who thinks that the virus isn't a big deal or that it'll pass over uh, within a short amount of time, then you're looking at these prices thinking, man, everyone is panicking. This is the time to get in. So, you know, the panic was really high Thursday and you, you know, you saw the next day just how strong that bounce was. I mean, it, it completely matched the type of fear that we saw Thursday. So I'm not surprised by the 10% move to the upside, but do I think it's sustainable? No. Yeah, definitely. And that's a really good point because the, the move essentially, you know, came out of, in my opinion, oversold conditions. And yeah, you're absolutely right. It came out of all the fear and everyone who probably sold what seems to be the bottom right? And then you see this reverse move to the upside. But in terms of technicals, you know, for those of you who follow technicals, all we really did was smash up into the, the previous support, which was our previous base that we held, you know, the few days before that. Then we went down, came back up, tested it as resistance. So we should be expecting on Monday, either we push on through or we just get sent back down again. And the technical damage will really be done is if we get sent back down to this low again, right here in the next week, and then we start breaking it. Correct, I agree with you um, on that thesis, but I think even if we break through that support on Monday, you still gotta wait one more day um, because I think the market could come up to that 286 level before it ends up coming down. I don't think it'll cross above there uh, if the market wants to continue to, to go down or at least create some type of base or range. Uh, so, you know, keep an eye out for that. And, and ultimately, you have to decide as an investor how much you think this virus will affect your day-to-day -day life. Because if you think it hasn't affect, affected it yet, then, then the market is not in, or the bottom is not in. You have to consistently wait for the market to digest the news, digest the fear. And even though volatility is high and prices have been shaking really, really fast, that's not an indication of, of any type of bottom or any type of bottom in the fear. So, you know, technicals are, are, are important during this time, but it's, it's not everything at this time and sometimes technical indicators could be wrong so just keep an eye out for that and and, and be patient with with technicals and when they break through uh ranges and and break down through ranges yeah 100 percent. and you know it's funny you say that uh what what exactly has been the impact of the virus and we spoke about this before the call and we spoke about how it doesn't really seem like the virus itself and the impact that it's had so far on the economy uh, as well as maybe the future impact that it will have has not been factored into price what is your take on that well i 
personally, I'm from Houston, Texas. And if you're from down here, you know how complacent people can be about something like this. So for me to kind of feel like the worst has yet to come, yet I'm still seeing people complacent, even though you can go to grocery stores and, and everything's being cleaned out, there's still a lot of complacency about the virus and, and how much it can spread and really how much it can affect the business, uh, the business world, despite the massive stimulus that we, the, the stimulus promise that we got on Thursday about the 1.5 billion uh, repo bailout, you know, for the airline industry, the cruise industry and the hospitality industry. Uh, but you also got to factor in the oil industry, some parts of the retail industry, a ton of the small business industry that I don't know if the 1.5 trillion can, can cover so even if you have a lot of people being optimistic because they say as long as the government is willing to hold up the, the businesses, this could be the bottom. You had a really high, high spike in fear. I want to go ahead and take a look at the VIX real, real quick. You know, the VIX went up to a substantial amount. If you can go back even longer term, I mean, the level that the VIX went up to I think is close to the 2018. I mean, yeah, it, it's close to the 2008 co uh, correction, which was uh, unbelievable. And I think you can warrant that at this point in time to say the fear is too high, the bottom is in, and you should start to see buyers start to buy assets. But I don't think this thing is over. I think we're dealing with an issue that is really hard to understand. And we're also dealing in a time where people naturally want to to jump into a market we were just at all-time highs two months ago people are still feeling a little bit euphoric there was a lot going for the market before this coronavirus hit so you know if you start to see these upside swings like we saw on on friday the 10 percent move to the upside you may see another move like that five six percent in a day and, and i think that's a direct result of too much panic, too much fear, and you have enough good news to create this type of short-term rally. But in the end, I think this is just, we are maybe 50 to 60% done with this correction. Um, until we get the, the news about how many mass case, or how many cases there are in the US, because we just started mass testing this weekend. Like I know in Houston, Texas, I had a friend who thought he may have been infected with the virus and he tried to get tested Thursday, I believe. And he had to call so many different departments. And ultimately, one of the departments said we can send it, I think it was the ER, they said that they could send in his test results, but it would cost him $500 to send it to the CDC. Now, wow. speaking, yeah, now speaking today, Sunday, um, we have a little bit more testing areas. I haven't gone to one myself, so I can't speak on how effective it is or how many people they're testing per day. But that's where we are in this whole cycle. So even though the fear is extremely high and, and what the market is telling you is, you know, in historical context, when the panic is in, that's when you buy. In reality, we are not even close to being done with this, this event. So the, the, the main issue is, as this event kind of unfolds, it will start to affect more and more businesses and you could potentially see more shutdowns. And so I think you know, the fear could get astronomically higher than what we saw in 2009, which is crazy to say because it was one of the worst financial crises of all time, crises of all time. But people really should be open-minded to this, this type of event. Yeah, that's, that's a really great point. And to add to that, I, I'm definitely of the opinion that the bottom is not in. And I would probably say that with at least, you know, 70% confidence. And here's a couple reasons why. I was telling one of my friends earlier, um, you know, number one, right? We are just starting to witness the, the exponential growth of how this virus is spreading. Okay. Just today, I was just reading the news that Italy now found 3,400 new cases over the last day and a half, 3,400, wow. right? So people see, I think humans understand when things grow at a you know, 10% rate, 50% rate, but they don't understand how things can just double and double and double overnight every single day until one, two months down. They don't understand. We, we don't, we're not trained to think in exponential terms because that's just, 
you know, too many big numbers all at once, right? That's very so true. When, and so when you see something like exponential growth, seeing this virus spread, right? Because if you think about it three weeks ago or two weeks ago, we had like maybe two cases, four cases of coronavirus. Now the U.S. is at uh, thousands, maybe like 10 or 15,000, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so now you have countries around the world reacting where entire countries and their borders are shutting down. Just today, one of my friends from Amsterdam, he was telling me that Netherlands uh, just this morning started uh, having uh, lockdowns across the country, okay? Germany seized all their borders with, uh, uh, with Netherlands, with uh, Switzerland, with France, anyone nearby, right? Uh, Italy, same thing, okay? The Colombia, where I'm staying right now, Medellin, it now had just 34 cases, okay, over the last week, okay? And we're not allowing any more people, uh, uh, tourists even into the country, okay? So what you're seeing now is global impact, not only on just you know, tourism, but you're also seeing it internally starting to affect businesses. You're starting to see it affect supply chain. And then on top of that, you add what we recently had was the oil shock, okay, which is definitely going to have a bigger impact in the coming, you know, few weeks, mm -hmm. okay. And then you also don't have any sort of containment for the, for the virus and no real cure uh, in, in sight. So how can we say that the, the bottom is in when you have so many things that are just starting to pan out, you know? That's a great point. And, and you know, I've had the, the privilege to talk to some money managers about the situation and how they feel. And the notion is that this is just like another virus. So we've dealt with SARS, we've dealt with the bird flu, and money managers and institutions, some of them, definitely think that this is just like them. The, the fear will pass. And when you see the VIX kind of spike to levels uh, that we saw in 08, 09, that gives them a signal that's saying, hey, if this is just like the, the, the previous diseases in the past, the fear is astronomically high to the point where I kind of have to buy something. So I, I think there's, that's where the rationality comes in. But like you said, we haven't even talked about the implications with oil, small business. Um, you know, oil going down this much is supposed to be a great thing, but if people aren't allowed to go out into the world and spend the money that they save from, from lower gas prices, what the hell is the point? You right. know, all it does is put so much pressure on our energy sector. And if people aren't even going out and driving their cars, that demand is going to go down even more. And so oil prices could really, I mean, they're under so much pressure. I would not be surprised if they dip below 30. And then you really start to get the panic in the, in the energy sector, which, you know, right now we're just paying attention to the cruise line, airline sector, and hospitality sector. But I think uh, this virus just, it's just a, a demon to the entire credit financial system. And I think there's just so much more that has to play out in reality. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, um, uh, I also read this somewhere, and it's also my personal opinion that I feel like in many ways, this virus was sort of the, the needle to the bubble that we had already been creating, right? Given the fact that over the last several months, uh, especially since Trump got uh, into office, all we've really been doing is creating lower interest rates, doing QE injections into these repo bailouts. And even though, you know, Trump doesn't want to call it QE, it, that's exactly what it is. I mean, just, you know, clearly printing of money. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so this, this virus, I feel like it's exposing all the flaws and all the holes that we had already been building into major economies across the world. Totally. Um, I, I agree with that point. And, and how I'm trying to look at it is, I don't know if I'm right or, or wrong. I'm not an expert in, in understanding credit and, and the balance of debt in the entire business system. But I believe that when I go outside and I look around at all the businesses that, that open their lights in the morning, you know, right at 6 a.m. or whenever they open, that is all backed by this financial system that is pumped by credit, at least in this time and space. 
companies have wanted to grow faster than, than ever before. There's a lot of technology that they could use to grow. There's a lot of opportunity out there. And because of that, companies have opted small and large to, to be more on credit and to grow in that sense. And I think it's happened since the 08 recession, you know, when interest rates were low, we just got on a lot of debt. And that the purpose of that was to maintain that everything stays on that when you walk out when you walk out of your your apartment or your house and you go on to the world that everything is working as it should so what happens when something comes around and just pops that thing nothing is working as it should everything has to stop that underlying financial system that's backed by credit doesn't stop that is still interwoven in into everything but everything else has stopped around it so I continuously think to myself, I can't even understand the implications of what's about to happen because never before I think would, would we have ever discounted the entire system just stopping, people not going out and, and shopping, businesses not being open, not turning on their lights in the morning. And so I, I think that if you're someone who's looking at this as, as a different virus, because I think you were telling me before, and I wasn't aware of this, that in the previous diseases, we've never had shutdowns like this, correct? We've no, had, absolutely not. I mean, I think it was just today that Nike said that they're shutting down all of their U.S. stores, okay? I mean, we haven't even gotten the mass testing numbers yet, and they're already shutting yeah. down all the stores? I mean, I, I genuinely think that you're right. This could have been the, the pin to pop that bubble, but I never really thought it would be a bubble. Everything was supposed to run as it should, and as long as it did, this thing would, would continue to play out for however long. But yeah. as soon as, as an event comes on that says, no, you can't operate at all, yet the underlying system will still need to pay off debt and, and still need to hold all this, this financial burden that was there before, you know, you have to deal with that. And, and I don't know what the U.S. will look like once, once this event completely plays out, to be honest. Yep. That's, that's a great point. And, and I'm, Glad you brought up the the debt and the um, uh, potential, you know, uh, way the U.S. economy runs on credit. Because I actually read this on the uh, Federal Reserve website. And for those of you who want to read this, I'll put this link uh, in the YouTube description below. But overall, the the federal uh, the central bank portfolio as of last week, okay, was four point two trillion dollars. Okay, and we just obviously added. Uh, 1.5 trillion in the repo bailouts, right? I think the last Wednesday or Thursday. So we basically increased our portfolio of the central bank by 30% almost, 30 to 40%, okay? Add to that what we've been doing the last two years, and if we start reading this, it, it's almost perplexing that we've just been ramping up debt like it's no one's business. And combine that with you know, the, the technical damage that we've already done over the last several weeks, uh, maybe a potential recession that is uh, starting and building, and then potential surge in the, the credit defaults and should be coming up in the next several months, given the fact that the virus has severely impacted uh, the business's ability to, you know, move capital around or potentially try to grow their business. You know, it almost in many ways ensures that we have another big movement down in the markets. It just doesn't seem to me like, okay, well, this is it. I mean, I guess, you know, the whole coronavirus scare is done and now it's over with. And this is just, you know, starting to ramp up. And like you said, I think we're maybe like 50 or 60% in it, but 50, 60% in the movement doesn't mean that, you know, maybe that the downside risk of, uh, how long this could prolong as well as how deep it could go it just doesn't cover it we, i don't think we are fully able to uh, fathom the widespread impact of how this could affect uh, the economies at large exactly and i think what we've also been seeing in the past two weeks as institutions kind of panic with with what's happening to their stock prices You've had analysts come out and try and give these calls. Like they, they made calls on Uber, Visa, um, you know, other different stocks saying the bottom is in. The prices look extremely attractive. 
and you just like i'm like what are you guys doing first of all for a company like uber which relies on heavily on on travel if you're seeing everything stop like why yeah. are you coming in saying the stock price has gone down and up and it's those types of calls and analyst calls that really make me feel like okay there's still a lot of optimism on this side and that's scary because reality is not showing that but you're still having people panic because of what's been happening with the price action and so those calls to me are just signs that we're not done yet that that there's still enough optimism to get buyers to to take us up in the next leg only to be sold off by by you know the bigger institutions that see that this is a longer term problem and i think you know when the market was going up from january to march it was ignoring a lot of what was going on in china about the coronavirus and everything and i think once it got the notion that it may have been wrong which the market is almost never wrong you know right. the market usually can can predict very well i think this is one of those times where the market was deeply wrong and you had people that once they realized the long term effects of what was happening it was just sell everything sell yeah. everything and everything fast and that's why we we saw such a high volatility spike but i think it's warranted and on the other side you know after those volatility spikes you have people uh preemptively saying hey stocks are still at great valuations even though like i've said in my discord channel um valuations mean nothing at this point because you can't quantify uh yearly guidances at all when you have stores shutting down you know i i even think last week there was a call made on nike that that nike was at an attractive buying point and then to see it today you know closing all their stores i want to see what that dude <laughs> says about that stock now and so yeah. don't listen to these analyst calls don't listen to the big banks the more you see people putting out optimistic calls i think that's that's a warning sign when you finally start to see these institutions say okay we're cutting guidance by 50 60% the the stock price is getting cut you know from from $100 to now $33 that's when you should start maybe nibbling in but for now there's still a lot of optimism in the market for me to to think that the bottom is not in yet yeah that that's that's a really great point um you know we we were talking about uh uh last week i think you know there was um if we start looking at gold right if we start looking at gold in the same manner as this leg down uh what we had in the 2008 2009 area okay mm -hmm. um this is where uh you know we started to see the mass selling and fear starting to set in okay mm -hmm. and this was people thought that okay well you know if gold is going down too it looks like man things are getting really really bad and this is for the most part, uh, and again, people who are watching this, oftentimes, typically what happens, folks, is that you will see larger institutions uh, and bigger players in the markets get margin called on their positions. Okay, so what they will probably have to do is start liquidating maybe some of their gold positions, uh, maybe even some of their bond positions, and you'll see gold trickling down, you know, with the equity market. So they'll actually be, you know, pretty much in one-to-one -one correlation, or almost, and then what happens is once you see equity start selling off more and then margin calls were covered, you see then gold taking off into the midst of the recession, okay, like it did over here. Because remember, 2009 essentially was really the big brunt of it. And then all the way into early 2011 is where you started to see equities maybe starting, up, uh, starting to form a bottom. And by then, gold had already reached from its low to that middle of 2011 or so. Uh, almost a hundred percent. Okay. So what we're seeing right now is almost similar characteristics in the pattern of gold starting to sell off because there's a liquidity crunch because as Fassel said, everyone is looking to sell. Why? Because panic has started to ensue. People just want to get in cash. Either they want to get in cash or they want to be in bonds. And if institutions are looking for a yield anywhere, okay, they'll probably be getting into bonds or they're starting to probably potentially load up on gold, okay? They're obviously, in my opinion, if you're a smart institution, you know, you're looking at this as maybe a potential bottom, but if the bottom really doesn't seem to form itself, right? We can go back to what we were talking about earlier uh, with FASO is, you know, Dow theory states that 
there's usually, you know, three phases to a bear market. The first leg down is usually, you know, sort of a big sell off like this. The next, you know, phase is usually just arranging like this. We don't really know how long, um, but let's just say, you know, it's a, maybe a few months, right? And then we'll start ranging like this. This is where people start thinking that, okay, this is the bottom. And then usually you have a big spike down. That's your, usually your final capitulation. This is, uh, as per Dow theory, the, the distribution phase. And for those of you who are more tech savvy or technical savvy, we call this a bear flag, right? And so in these bear flags, you basically have uh, bigger players who are trying to get out of the market, maybe, you know, get rid of some excess inventory off their books and then potentially start loading up on puts or shorts. And that's where you see that final leg down. And this is where we can then start talking about capitulation. So yes, I do believe that the VIX being at all time fear high doesn't mean anything if we have not contained uh, the, the many factors that are still impacting the economy. Correct, I, I completely agree with that. Yeah, so um, you know, aside from looking at the S&P 500, you know, one thing obviously in our community, as you guys very well know, we're, we're very big into crypto, okay? Now one thing I could tell you about crypto and Bitcoin is that it had a massive sell off. Okay, obviously you guys know whoever's watching this video. Um, we went from the mid-February high down to two days ago or three days ago, almost 66% down. Holy crap. <laughs> that was a yeah. major sell. Yeah, that's, that's almost, you know, uh, less than 20 days of work right there. Okay. Now, one thing I could tell you guys, whoever's watching this video, okay, for those of you who want to make the argument about Bitcoin or crypto being a safe haven, it's clearly not. It definitely has not shown that it has anywhere close to the strength of, you know, even withstanding the, the drawdowns of the S&P 500. In fact, it got sold off almost at a 2.5 uh, X rate uh, than the S&P 500. So what that tells you is there's immense fear and uh, potential, you know, that this now what we're entering in is a risk off environment. And again, for those of you who are not familiar with that, it essentially means that a risk on environment is when the stock market is doing well, overall global economy sentiment is high, and you could take a couple of risks, right? You could take risks in, say, you know, small businesses, you could take risks in um, investing in things like crypto and Bitcoin because, hey, things are going well, everything is rosy and happy. But when you start seeing speculative assets like Bitcoin get sold like they're garbage, this is usually the first sign. This is usually the first sign that investors are looking in all directions to take liquidity out from wherever they can, meaning that they are looking to find cash and sell off whatever they can. And I think that Bitcoin in many cases, even though it's a small asset, has been leading the market in many ways because if you look over here, right, and I think I told Fassel this, that Bitcoin hit its top right here around 13th February, it started selling off right around 24th February. Okay. Now, if we look at the S&P 500, you know, 13th or 14th February, it was still climbing its way back up right around 21st February or so, right. Or this, I guess, 24th, 25th February, it started selling off and Bitcoin had already started selling off maybe a week or so before. Now, again, I can't definitively say that Bitcoin leads S&P or anything. Obviously there's not much data for that. But when you start seeing speculative assets like this start to get sold off, okay, it's not just a, hey, this is just a minor pullback. It's a, you know, Bitcoin is starting to sell off. S&P is starting to sell off. Um, gold is starting to sell off, right? Um, so th there's clearly a, a panic and a fear across the board in all asset classes. That means that everyone and their mother is looking to go into <laughs> cash. And I think this is where we need to start being a little bit careful about calling the bottom because these assets themselves, right, are telling you that, hey, it looks like all really uh, investors want to do is just start selling and selling. And that's it. There, there's really no, you know, potential bottom or buyback being formed yet. Okay. So that's what I wanted to relay to you guys watching right now is it's too early to form an opinion on whether this is a bottom. And again, we're not saying that downside, you know, has to happen. We're just saying that it's just too early to say that the bottom has been created. All we can go off of is the uh, technicals momentum, as well as the, you know, the, the fundamental uh, momentum of what's happening around the world.
I mean, personally, I would be very surprised if once the mass U.S. testing numbers start start coming out, that the market, you know, ends up ignoring ignoring that. And for instance, it's actually let's just say, for instance, it is priced in right now. I have a hard time believing it is um, just based on, like I've said, what we've seen from the analyst calls, the guidance numbers they have not been cut down enough. I really think that. If you're thinking that the the bottom in asset class and asset prices has been properly priced in at this point in time, it's it's not. I don't. You got to give me some data for that because I don't believe you. But you know, to go off what you were saying about the risk assets, you are entirely correct. And I've been sounding off the alarms a little bit with the small caps with the IWM index. So they have been telling me a little bit that there there is something shaky within the market. They were unable to make an all-time high. Considering interest rates are extremely low, they are a very interest rate sensitive sector. They rely heavily on loans for growth in their business. And even as the market was making all-time high, you know, Apple was leading the market, Microsoft, all these big companies, you should have seen small caps break above their, their highs that they made in August, but they didn't. And you kind of see how it touched the high, it wasn't able to break it, and then, you saw the selling immediately come in. And to, to prove to your point, you know, Bitcoin may end up leading, may be a sign that, that uh, if it starts to sell off, the market could end up following it. I also think small caps is in that same theory that, you know, when you start to see risk assets sell off and underperform, we never saw a breakout. We never saw the momentum come in. That's when you got to get a little bit worried. And I was always telling people, when you didn't see this, this movement, when you had so much going for the economy, you had a strong U.S. consumer, a strong, supposedly strong uh, economic background, low interest rates, you should have seen this sector really outperform. And the fact that it was never able to break out was always a warning sign. And, you know, look what happened now. The, these guys are going to be under so much pressure. They broke the 2019 lows or the 2018 lows, which was uh, in, in part to the trade discussions that were being halted. That had an enormous effect on these small businesses because a lot of them relied on China to get supplies. And, and the uncertainty around that event was extremely high. So to break that level by such a wide margin is extremely scary, and I think it's only indicative that that there is more downside pressure to come. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Um, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Zero Hedge, this is by far one of my favorite resources to uh, read up on. Whether it's you know what's happening uh, from a political standpoint or economical, they they really give you some really good uh, unbiased insight. And I found this article particularly informative but also alarming because you know from Fassel and I are fairly well well versed in how the stock market performs but we have no idea how uh, things like the coronavirus how the medical field gets impacted how hospitals deal with you know people coming in with sicknesses how you know they may be running out of beds as this article says um, you know more people might require uh, respirators these are all things that America's never really faced. Italy has already started to see that respirators are almost like a gold mine to find because if you're someone who's requiring uh, serious um, uh, health issue, or if you're requiring uh, serious help in terms of your health issues, a respirator is almost, you know, uh, like finding a diamond in the rough right now because Italy has by far been impacted, uh, I think, far greater than, than Korea or any other country in terms of old people uh, mm -hmm. getting hit by the virus as well as old people dying. Okay, so finding a respirator in a hospital and on top of that, you know, even just finding a bed has become extremely difficult. Now, if we translate that into America, given that we already have a shitty healthcare system, we're looking at a, a lot of people who are going to start you know, piling into hospitals we may not have beds, we may not have as many respirators, right? Um, and we're just very underprepared for what may soon uh, be coming uh, in, in terms of the virus being spread at an exponential rate. 
Very true. I think money will be shifting towards necessities. People will not be looking to invest money. That's why I was saying some people were messaging me about gold and, and how I felt about gold being a, a proper hedge for this market. And I was just saying, I don't know, because in my mind, I'm trying to take out money from the market and put it into a stockpile in case I need to go out and get groceries or I need to go out and get necessities. I don't think even during the recession, I was young during the recession, so I'd never had to deal with that myself. But in my mindset today, I'm like, money is needs to be shifted towards necessities at this point, because when access to resources starts to look a little bit shaky, which I don't think access to resources was shaky during the recession. I think you could still go to the grocery store and get what you want. The problem is you just may have not had enough money to get everything you wanted. But when access to resources and the availability of resources becomes slim, that's an entirely different ballgame for how people invest their money or, or choose to allocate their money. So, you know, I, I, like I said, I don't even know to your point about Italy. They had a great healthcare system before and they're just getting overrun. And God, I don't even know what their stock market is like or anything like that or how their yeah. assets have been doing. But if that were to happen here on a mass scale, I mean, no matter what you pick, I, you know, there's a lot of smart people that say buy Netflix. I was even saying on the Discord channel, Facebook and PayPal, because they're online businesses, they should be, uh, for the most part, fine. People will do online shopping. I actually don't think that anymore. I think that, you know, I think that Facebook, for the most part, some smart person, I forgot, I think it was uh, David Tepper said this morning that he doesn't like Facebook because businesses will start to cut their marketing capex and Facebook should see a hit from that. Now, while I think that Facebook is, I'm sorry, what were you going to say? No, 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 go ahead. Uh, now, while I think Facebook is, is essential and won't see the main capex cuts that I think he will, he's saying, you know, it's indicative of where people are going to allocate money to necessities. And I think, yeah, Facebook will get hit from that. They won't see as much businesses uh, coming to them to market, let alone if businesses aren't open, they're definitely not going to market at all. And PayPal, if businesses aren't even being open, then there's no even need to use PayPal. You're not going to get your goods. You're not shopping for those goods. So, you know, Netflix, I've heard a lot of smart people recommend Netflix as a result. And I think Netflix is fine. Like it makes sense to, as people stay at home, this is becoming a necessity as far as, you know, to cure boredom or whatever, to pass time, Netflix, Comcast, all these different content providers. But like I said, the fear of, of how bad this thing can get, don't think if you buying something that's supposedly has a natural advantage in this environment, don't think that your asset is safe from decline. You know, Netflix yeah. could still come down and break through its 28, 2019 lows easily, in my opinion, even though, like many people have said, it should have an advantage, advantageous um, characteristic in this environment. Yeah, that's that's a really great point. Um, now, lastly, uh, I, I wanted to talk about, um, you know, Man, I can't think. <laughs> I feel like we've discussed the coronavirus so much. I know. Um, that's the main thing. <laughs> I know. I swear. I swear. Um, well, uh, is, is there anything that you'd want to talk about? I think uh, this is what, one thing that I want to talk about, uh, which was, I found it really interesting. Uh, let me see here. Um, this was posted end of November 2019. You know, I'm a big Ray Dalio fan, and I thought this was really interesting that they started betting you know, that the, the market itself was uh, overstretched and they had, you know, apparently $1.5 billion uh, option that, um, and you could see that this was again, written in November uh, and has bet more than $1 billion that stock markets around the world will fall by March. This is, <laughs> this is some, this is some crazy, like, you know, crystal balling, man. I swear. <laughs> no, it's, it's so funny because he probably got killed on that trade because the market ran up from January literally to March. So if it expired at the beginning of March, then that dude lost all his money. He just needed to buy till April. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I think um, I, I don't really know if their, you know, options were 
I guess, you know, for, for uh, uh, March expiries or anything, you know, because I think he's saying that the markets were set to fall by March. So I would figure that he's oh, smart okay. enough to yeah. not buy March options. He'd probably buy like, you know, out into, you know, say um, uh, August or September or something. You know? Uh-huh. Um, I don't. I, just know, I don't know if he could. I don't know if he could predict though that that the market was going to have the run that it did from from January to March. Though it was, it was quite a, a a really good run for a lot of these assets. Like you had Apple just spiking up crazy every day. So yeah. hopefully, yeah, he didn't have it expiring on March. That would be bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess we might see Ridalio, you know, uh, say that he's bankrupt next week. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that that'd be hard to believe. He got too much money. I know, seriously. Um, well, uh, before I think we get off, is there anything that you want to talk about? Yeah, um, I just wanted to implore people while you guys are not, I mean, if you are trading, good luck. But if you're not trading, staying on the sidelines, the number one thing you got to do, I'm a firm believer that even though it looks ugly and it's going to continue to look ugly for the next couple of weeks, months, there will be light at the end of the tunnel. So start making lists of of the assets that you want to invest in now that you think okay if the worst comes to worst which ones are which companies are the ones that are going to bounce back the fastest so start making your list now in my opinion you should definitely look into the software sector i think that they've done more than enough to create a necessity with modern day businesses that you know businesses of all sizes need them to maintain their operating efficiency maintain a lot of the small uh, processes that have been that used to be kind of legacy whether they were done on paper or anything like that or they were kind of all scattered in files or whatever everything's been moved to the cloud you're still going to need those businesses back up and running once everything is up and running again so I expect their growth to continue to be great once this entire this entire mess is done, given businesses can bounce back fairly effectively. But that's what I would do right now. And I implore people to just make lists of their favorite assets, watch the prices, and continue to monitor how this virus plays out so that when the time comes that you feel ready to invest, you don't need to make your list anymore. You don't need to waste time. Just have everything set for now. Awesome. That is great advice. And folks, just so you know, again, we are not here to offer you financial advice. We're simply discussing the markets. And as you very well know, Fassel and I uh, day trade our respective markets. And so in our Advantage community, and by the way, you can go to cryptosomniac.com, go to the products page, and then get the Advantage subscription right there. So in our Advantage community, we have a host of channels right here, uh, whether it's crypto related or equities related. Uh, we discuss exactly the kinds of positions that we're taking, our outlook and analysis on the markets, and we're also here to answer any questions that you may have, okay? On top of that, starting April, we're also opening up a Forex analysis and chat, options analysis and chat, and oil analysis and chat. So I think we're going to have a lot of interest in these channels, and I'm really excited to start uh, rolling these out. So get your subscriptions before we start increasing the price on our membership. Okay. So you could be grandfathered in at a better rate. All right. But with that being said, thank you so much for watching. Hit a thumbs up and uh, till then I'll see y'all next week. All right. Take care and have a good rest of your Sunday. Cheers. Cheers.